This video is about a method for measuring inductors and capacitors using an oscilloscope and a signal generator. It's useful if you don't own an LCR meter, and it's interesting because the technique it uses is related to how LCR meters work. The method is based on this application note from Tektronix. I'll put a link to the application note below. I'll also include an interesting video from Roden Schwartz on LCR meters in case you're not familiar with them. There'll also be a link to a C program that does the calculations that this method requires. I'll compare this method against the popular TC1 tester and also against a resonance method that I presented in a previous video. I'll put a link to that below. And I'll be using 19 different 5% tolerance inductors and 5 1% tolerance capacitors. Unlike the TC1 and the resonance method, this method allows you to choose the test frequency to match a datasheet or your planned operating frequency. You'll need a signal generator to produce the input sine wave and a resistor of known value. You'll also need an oscilloscope to make the measurements. I'll use an 80 ALM2000 to both generate the signal and make the measurements. I'll put a link to my introductory video on the 80 ALM2000 below. The app note focuses on the series model of a non-ideal inductor or capacitor. That's a model in which the device under test, the DUT, is assumed to have a resistor in series with the, with the device itself. And one of the goals of the method is to measure the value of that extra resistance, R ESR. It's also possible to use this method with the parallel model, although I won't go into too much detail on that. In order to measure an inductor, create the circuit shown. You'll need to measure three things, Vn, Vdut, and, and a phase difference. So Vn is the amplitude of the signal as measured at point A1, and Vdut is the amplitude of the signal measured at point A2. The phase difference is the well, the phase difference between the V dot and the VN signals. And the way you measure that with an oscilloscope is to measure the time between rising edges, in particular the time between the rising edge of V dot and the time between the rising edge of VN. For, a, for an inductor, that time will be positive. You can then compute the phase difference by dividing the time difference by the period of the test signal. The measurements for a capacitor are basically the same. The difference is that the, the time difference between V dot and Vn will be negative in the case of a capacitor. After measuring the amplitudes of Vn and V dot, and also the phase difference theta, we have to do math to, to compute the results. The equations are shown on the slide, and they look pretty complicated, but I've written a C program that will be available from GitHub to do the computations for you. But basically, what you're computing is, first of all, the, the magnitude of the complex impedance Z, and then also the angle of the complex impedance Z. And then from that, you can you can, you can compute R ESR and um, the reactance of the device under test. And then from those, you can compute either an impedance or a capacitance, depending on whether the angle is greater than zero or less than zero. Let's try it. We'll, we'll start by measuring a one millihenry 5% tolerance inductor. Here's the test setup. You can see the inductor and the reference resistor. It's pretty simple. We'll use the ADALM2000 to make the measurements. I've made several videos on this device. I'll put a link to an introductory video below. Uh, we're going to do two things with it. We're going to use its signal generator to create the input and use its, um, use its oscilloscope to measure the amplitudes and the phase difference between the two signals, as we've discussed. So first, we'll look at the signal generator. And we have it set to generate a 100 kilohertz sine wave with a 10 volt peak to peak amplitude. And so now we can go to the oscilloscope and we see our two signals. And um, the, well, let's just zoom out for a second. So you can see them a little bit better. The, the orange signal is, is Vn and the purple signal is V dot. And so what we have to do is to measure both of their amplitudes and the phase difference between the, between the two. And uh, we'll do that by measuring the time difference between the two and divide by the period. So now let's first measure that time, dis dis time difference. So I'm going to adjust the time base again to get me more space. And uh, so I'll turn that menu off. 
And now we have a cursor that's measuring the time between the trigger point of Vn and wherever the cursor is on Vdut. So I'm measuring the time between Vn and Vdut instead of the time between v, Vdut and Vn. And for that reason, I'll have to change the sign of the time difference when I entered into the calculation. So now I just move this cursor down to the zero line as best I can. And this actually looks pretty good. We're using cursor one and we can see that the noise in the system is causing the uh, value to jump between small positive and small negative values. So I'm probably in the right place. And I'm getting a time of a time difference of minus 1.596 microseconds. So let's let, let's enter that into the computation. And I've uh, written a small C program to do the computation. And I've already entered the uh, value of my reference resistor, which is 992.3 ohms, and also the signal frequency, which as we saw was 100 kilohertz. So now here I'm going to enter the time difference, changing the sign, like I said. 96E minus 6 for microseconds. And uh, now we have, we'll measure the amplitude of the signals. And for that, I'll change the time base to, to uh, get more signal to measure. And then we'll go to the measurement menu. And we're using um, Scopey statistics. And that's good because that gives us the benefit of averaging, but I have to do a reset to make sure that I haven't been averaging something that I shouldn't have been previously. So we can verify that our frequency is 100 kilohertz, and we see our amplitude of Vn and our amplitude of Vdut. So we have to enter those. So that's um, 9.491 for Vn and 5.116 for Vdut. And now the computation is done by my, my program, and we can see that our inductor is measuring as 1.01 millihenries, which is spot on. So this was a good good a good measurement. Um, the 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 effective serial resistance, however, I, I don't believe that. The, um, it's saying it's basically zero, and the the problem is that is that you have to measure that phase angle extremely precisely to measure small values of RESR. And this equipment can't do that. So you're not going to see a good value for RESR that's accurate to more than a few ohm, a value that's accurate to more than a few ohms. So if the serial resistance were higher, we, we might see something meaningful, but but this, this inductor has obviously got a pretty low serial resistance, so it can't measure it. Um, let's see what else. It, the, the program also computes the values using parallel mode, and the inductances happen to be the same in this case. It calculates Q, um, which is enormous be, because, again, the, the angle isn't, the really small angle isn't accurately measured. Ah, in fact, the program printed a warning saying that the angle was slightly beyond uh, 90 degrees. And, and it set it to exactly 90 degrees for that for that reason. Um, so the well, I guess that's a, about all there is to say about that. So we got a good measurement of, of inductance. That's how you measure an inductor using this method. I was curious about the ADALM 2000's ability to measure the angle accurately enough to measure the, the equivalent series resistance. So off camera, I stuck a 22 ohm as measured by my multimeter resistor in series with the inductor, and then I repeated the measurement steps. And uh, well, you can see the results this time are that we see an ESR of 18.7 ohms, and then the uh, series mode inductance didn't change much either, uh, which makes sense. So that gives me some confidence that if, if done carefully, one might be able to measure, oh, with the, the ESR within, say, 10 ohms uh, using this equipment. So are the results always this good? The short answer is no. I tested 19 different inductors, ranging from 22 microhenries to 150 millihenries, all 5% tolerance parts. And I used a 100 kilohertz test frequency for the smaller inductors and lower frequencies from, from some larger ones. And I produced this table of results that's you know, probably too small to read. Uh, the key thing will be to look at the percent error in the in inductance measurement compared to the data sheet value of the part. And we'll look at that on the, on the next slide. 
One thing I'll point out is is that this uh, Tektronix method could work better with more carefully chosen resistor values and perhaps frequency choices as well. I did some experiments, and that's one reason why the why the column whether there are as many columns as there are, but there's too much detail to go through. Here's a somewhat more readable version of the results. The Tektronix app note method is the dark red bar on the left in this bar chart. And you can see that all of the results were within 10% of the datasheet value for the part. I think that's pretty good, although it's interesting that they always missed high. And there, there are some other results on this chart as well. I also used a TC1 tester to test the parts, and also this resonance method that I discussed in a previous video. The TC1 wasn't great. You you can see it's the uh, oh, it's the orange, and uh, it generally had results that were worse than the Tektronix app note. I don't know what happened with the tenth inductor I tested. The TC1 missed low on it very badly, and that was reproducible. I just don't know why the TC1 doesn't like that particular inductor. The resonance method has two results. The yellow bars are when you just measure the frequency and use a formula to compute an inductance. You'll have to view the video for the details of that. And those results aren't good at all. The second result from the resonance method is when you get the frequency of the inductor in parallel with the 100 picofarad cap, and then also measure the self-resonant frequency of the inductor, and then use that to calculate the uh, distributed capacitance of the inductor and take that into account. And this second method, uh, shown in green, does better and in fact does very well for smaller inductors. But as soon as the inductors approached um, one millihenry, the results started to deteriorate and became quite poor for large inductors. I thought that, that using a larger capacitor than that 100 picofarad capacitor would help that, but it didn't. That's a bit mysterious to me. To understand this, again, you'll probably have to look at that other video, which is linked to below. So the bottom line is that the method of the Tektronix app note did very well. I think it did better than any of the other methods and uh, was in every case you know, within 10% of, of the data sheet value. I also tested five 1% tolerance capacitors with values ranging from 100 picofarads to one microfarad. In addition, I tested one 10 microfarad capacitor from my junk drawer. It's a ceramic disc that gave strange results. And here I tested with the TC1 again, and also my Kaiweets uh, digital multimeter, and of course the Tektronix app note method. And like before, I have percent error results on the next slide, so let's look at that. The app note method is shown in the dark red rectangles as before, and here it ran into trouble. It wasn't good for measuring the 100 picofarad capacitor. Um, it was just hard to get a measurement with a capacitance value that low. Uh, whereas the TC1 and the digital multimeter did very well uh, for all of the all of the c capacitor sizes. The uh, the 10 microfarad capacitor from the junk drawer got varying results from all three, so I'm not quite sure what's up with that capacitor, but I, I don't have a data sheet for it and don't know much about it, so I'm not going to worry. In summary, I'm very impressed with the method from this Tektronix app note. I think you should try it if you haven't spent hundreds of dollars on a LCR meter. I think I'll end the video here. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.